talk. The next talk is on persistent uh, fault attacks. And the talk is a joint work between uh, Xinjia University, Entity Labs, Huai, uh, Institute of North Electronic Equipments. And the talk will be given by Fan Zhang from Zhejiang University. Okay, uh, good afternoon. My name is Fan Zhang, and uh, this work uh, is going to propose a new tag uh, for the attacks, but mainly focus on the fault analysis. And this work is done by my student, also with Shivan Wei and Professor Kui Ren from Zhejiang University. So uh, I just want to mention that uh, some of the slides uh, are adopted from Joseph in the IACR summer school in 2015. Uh, fault attack is an active attack and uh, was first proposed by Don Bonnet in 1996. It has two stages, the online fault injection stage and the offline fault analysis stage. Um, the adversary needs some equipment to generate non-invasive, semi-invasive or invasive um, injections. So this could be done by the clock glitch, voltage glitch, EMFI or uh, laser FI. So most of the fault attacks uh, are non-invasive attacks. When we talk about the fault attacks, uh, we need to mention about the fault model. Uh, includes uh, fault width, fault type, fault location, and timing. So fault location here means um, in which byte or nibble the fault is injected. And the timing means uh, like uh, in which round or in which operation the fault is injected. And uh, those who experience with the uh, physical experiment of uh, photo attacks, uh, you know like uh, it requires a very tight or precise timing control. And according to the durations, normally there are two types. One is called transient. Transient forms, uh, it lasts a very short while, normally uh, an operation in one round. Another is called a permanent force, so it will damage the circuit. So in this paper, we are going to propose a new fault, like a persistent fault. Here, the fault will last a little bit longer, so it will cross multiple rounds or even multiple encryptions. Uh, when we talk about the fault attacks, we need to address the countermeasures. Typically, there are two categories. One is to harden the hardware. So for example, you in deploying the ring oscillators or some other sensors. Um, the other is to harden the com computations, for example, using the uh, redundant encryption or the invasive decryption. I summarize some disadvantages of the previous work. First, that uh, they require very tight time synchronization between the encryption and the injection. Second, uh, the Analysis is relatively complicated due to the random value, also the, uh, the fault propagation. And uh, most of them may not work if there are some countermeasures against the fault attacks. Now, I introduce the position fault attack uh, about the fault model. Uh, first, uh, we assume the adversary can inject the fault before the encryption of the block cipher. Uh, second, uh, the the inject fault is persistent across multiple rounds and multiple inclusions. The third, uh, the adversary is able to read the cipher text. So this is quite normal. And uh, the watchdog counter, uh, this is out of our discussions. So the core idea of the persistent fault attack is that uh, instead of using the previous uh, tightly coupled fault injections, uh, we separate it into two stages. One is called uh, um, loosely coupled fault injection and uh, followed by a subsequent uh, increase stage. So totally we have uh, three stages. The interesting part of this one is um, uh, the, the persist fault is injected to the lookup tables. And the, however, the fault element may not be accessed during the encryption. So some of the ciphertext will be uh, correct, some are incorrect. 
And I want to emphasize that first, both of the ciphertext can be used for the fault analysis. And uh, another thing is that uh, we do not require the same plain text to be included, I mean, for twice. And uh, also, uh, one important thing is that this attack is designed to defeat some countermeasures. And so how we do the simple position fault analysis? It's just based on uh, a statistical analysis on the last round. And um, suppose uh, the correct element of the S-box, the value is V. After the fault injection, the value becomes V star. In a normal block cipher, so the last round, we have the uh, output of S-box, X order with the key, and it becomes the ciphertext. So we check the output of S-box, then you will see like a V star will appear twice, and you will never see the value of V. By checking the single one specific byte of the ciphertext, you will see um, some values will have a probability of 2 over 256, and some values have zero probability. Then the adversary has uh, three types of uh, options to explore the leakages. Once he sees the maximum value or the zero value, then he can directly know the value of key, uh, the key. Or he can explore other leakages, and which will reduce the key search sp space. So here is an illustration of uh, our analysis result. Uh, the figure here is quite similar to the traditional DPA or CPA. So the uh, axis is the number of ciphertext, and the y-axis is um, the, the appearance of the, or the probability of the, um, the values. So once you saw the red curve, you know um, the, you can deduce the key, which is associated with the value of V. Once you see the, 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 the blue curve, so he knows the key, which is associated to the value of V star. So, so here are some comparisons. Uh, advantage is that our attack is not a differential, and so in nature, and also it does not require to control the plain text. And the, 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 the adversary does not um, I mean necessary to, to do the very tight uh, like a synchronization. The fault model here is um, quite relaxed, could be byte, nibble, or a bit. PFA also can be applied to the um, multiple fault setting, also can bypass some like redundancy uh, fault countermeasures. The disadvantage is that uh, it may require higher numbers of ciphertext, and also um, could be detected by some built-in health check. Let's see how PFA on AES. So we assume like um, most of people here know the T-Box, S-Box implementation. And I3 here is um, another implementation where the last round uh, is using a different uh, T-Box, which can be found in the library libgcrypt. Here's the result on the PFA on the unprotected S-Box. So we show the result here. It's the exact same thing as the, um, the slides before. And uh, our work is uh, quite efficient and uh, robust, and uh, um, it can be um, done in through the two, two aspects. One is from the uh, theoretical estimation. The other one is do the, by our, uh, our code. So theoretical estimation is uh, quite similar to the coupon collected problem. And uh, both of the uh, results showing they are quite uh, consistent uh, so on average, uh, around uh, 2,000 uh, ciphertags are required to extract all the 16 bytes of key. And um, um, for the robustness, so we run the experiment for 1,000 times, uh, and um, the required uh, plain text, uh, uh, ciphertags uh, ranges from 1,600 to the uh, 3,500. On average, it's 2,200. Now we check uh, how PFA can work against some countermeasures. And the dual modular redundancy is a very well-known fault countermeasure. It can be done with uh, um, time redundancy or some spatial redundancy. There are two types. One is called uh, REDMR, 
redundant encryption based DMR. So the two modules will do the same encryption and compare the result. The second is called IDDMR. It's an inversive decryption based DMR. So the first module will do the encryption, and the output will be sent to the, the second module. And uh, the decrypted uh, plain text will be compared with uh, the original plain text and to see whether the fault is detected or not. So here, in nature, PFA is uh, against uh, REDMR. So we focus more on the IDDMR. And uh, for this is because for IDDMR, the encryption S table, uh, S box, uh, is uh, uh, different from the inversive S box. Okay, so the countermeasure scheme uh, has three different options based on the reaction. The first is uh, called the NCO, so the countermeasure. Uh, didn't uh, export any suffix, or we say ZVO, it just output uh, all zero values, or RCO, it outputs uh, a random number ciphertext. Um, for the IDMR, if the, both of the modules uh, are, use, are using the same memory and uh, the persistent fault is injected there, then our PFA can defeat this, all these three types of countermeasures. But for the IDDMR, um, it's uh, considered a little bit stronger countermeasure, but the thing is just slightly different. We check the PFA on the S box with the NCO, ZVO, on the IDDMR first. So compared with the um, IEDMR, so more cipher tags are required. This is because in IEDMR, all the cipher tests can be used for the analysis, but for the IDDMR, it's just a, a part of them can be used. So the ratio here is uh, denoted as P, which is uh, 0.56. And uh, we did the experiment for 1,000 times, and the, the number of uh, required cipher tags uh, ranges from 30,000 to uh, 30, hundred to the 70 hundred. So on average, it's about uh, 4,200. So if we increase the number of ciphertext uh, to above 7,000, uh, 7,200, and the success, success rate is uh, around 100. The PFA on the Xbox with the RCO, and in this case, uh, the adversary will not see the zero probability. But uh, the slight uh, probability difference can still be differentiated. So you can see from the, the figures. In practice, um, we can add the two thresholds to dif differentiate the, the abnormal cases. So we set a tall one as 90% uh, of the maximal probability and the tall two as 1.1 as the minimal probability. And um, uh, roughly, we, run, we need around uh, 20,000 uh, ciphertexts to uh, ex extract the keys for both of uh, S-Box and the T-Box implementations. And uh, from the figures, it uh, seems like uh, TOR1, using TOR1 is better than using TOR2. Next, we go through with a case study, uh, which is a Lohammer-based uh, PFA. And uh, Lohammer is a very threatening attack, uh, first proposed by King in 2014. So the basic idea of uh, Lohammer is that uh, uh, the adversary can repeatedly read two aggressive rows, and with a very high probability, uh, it will have some bit flips in the victim rows. The Lohammer is uh, attack is a hardware intrinsic and can be triggered from the software code. And also, it can gain the root privilege from the normal user privilege. So this is uh, very, very powerful. Another concept is a shared library, which is also very common uh, in computer systems. So uh, multiple 
processes and uh, uh, threads just shared one copy of the library. And um, so the attack scenario is that uh, the adversary can, can write his own code to do the AES encryption. Then, with his user space, he can launch the Rohan attack and try to flip one bit of the AES T-box. Then he can inform the victim to do the encryption and collect the cipher text. Then he, do some, he can do some offline analysis. So this is the, the basic idea. Since we don't have enough time, so I do not go through the details. But uh, here is uh, our setup of our Rohan experiment. We did the experiment in an old laptop. The OS is Ubuntu 12 and with an old kernel. So the library we target is libg crypt at 1.6.3, and the implementation is i3 I just mentioned. Here we show the, the uh, last round, the T0 prime, the table in the memory. So the target is, is that to inject one bit flip in these 256 elements. And uh, I want to mention that there are four tables in this area. <coughs> Here's our result of the hammering. So roughly, we tried 20 times, and four, five, four, six, five times I inject to the four different tables, and each trial is roughly one hour. And of course, we have some techniques to do the, to do the speed up, so we do the profiling. And yeah, so this is the result. And uh, we implant this one to do with some like a fault countermeasures. So we do it with uh, IEDMR. And uh, know that one injection can only recover four bytes. So totally, we need four injections. And uh, totally, we need uh, 8,200 ciphertext to break this type of uh, AES T box implementations. Okay, uh, conclusion, uh, we propose the position fault analysis, uh, which is a novel attack, and it can defeat uh, some fault uh, countermeasures. And uh, we did some implementations. Also, we tried some different uh, analysis. Uh, we do the security evaluations, so we demonstrate the lohammer based PFA uh, on the libg crypt. Future work. Uh, probably we need to do some more formal proofs um, on the Silic side, uh, rely on the coupon collector problem. And uh, we are interested to reveal the case for the key scheduling because uh, the AES table lookup will also be accessed there and uh, also some countermeasures. Okay, yeah, uh, that's it. Thank you. So are there any questions or comments? Thank you for your talk. So I have two questions. The first is like, um, I, it seems that you require the faulty cipher text for your analysis. Requires what? You require the faulty cipher text for your analysis. Yes. So, what do you think? Do, uh, does this attack will still work if you have an infective countermeasure? Does it uh, what? If you have an infective countermeasure, will this attack work? Ineffective countermeasure. Not ineffective. Infective countermeasure. Uh, I think uh, probably this countermeasure cannot work because our analysis are based on the. Uh, two type of ciphertext. No matter whether it's a faulty or correct, both ciphertext can be used to do the analysis. So using part of the ciphertext just increase the number of uh, ciphertext. Mm. This is what uh, I think. Okay. And another question is that if you if you are injecting fault, what is the probability? I mean, you are doing a probabilistic analysis, as a statistical analysis, as per I understand. So, what kind of metric did you use? Statistical metric did you use to get your attack done? I mean, like, uh, 
uh, what kind of statistical metric uh, statistical metric yeah i mean for for doing the attack what kind of statistical metric did you use uh, so this one as a we all know like a rohama is a, with a, some probability so uh, the key point here is that uh, we targeted on the AES of Xbox, so which is uh, public. So the simple policy is we, we just try and uh, to see whether the fault is injected and compare the known value of Xbox until we say for the specific, uh, like uh, any one element in the Xbox is uh, flipped. So it's not like uh, um, we just try, try, try until we find the bit flips. I see. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Uh, what kind of countermeasures you looked in uh, while you do PFA on countermeasures? So in the presentations, uh, I said that uh, we explored uh, two countermeasures. One is uh, IEDMR, so it's uh, just a uh, redundant encryption. The second is uh, IDDMR, inversive with dec decryption. Okay. Yeah, thanks for your talk. Uh, I have a question because uh, basically your criterion for decided that uh, bit is correct or not is according to the distribution of faulty um, ciphertext, right? Yeah. So then you did from the decryption last round. Okay, so in general, because the last round, your, um, your ninth round of the uh, input plus uh, key, that uh, ninth round input uh, is close to random. However, if you look at the first round, first round will be the print text plus key and goes to your S box. So in this way, I believe then the, the distribution will be easily to control and I believe precision will be better. I don't know, you, you already tried this or not? Uh, I'm not that clear about it, but uh uh, the thing is that uh, we want to demo the concept of a persistent fault attack. So yeah. the analysis on the last round, uh, it seems to us, uh, is a very simple one. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also, I have my students, uh, we did the analysis, we do it in the ninth round, and uh, it will reduce uh, the number of sectors. But uh, I'm not sure whether we can move to the, like, a first like round. Like the first round. I'm not sure. I yeah. uh, haven't tried yet. You yeah, haven't yeah. tried yet. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I have one question, like you say that you don't, don't need an explicit synchronization, right? So mm. you can essentially target any round to do the attack, is that so? Uh, so we say like, uh, actually I'm not sure, not this one. We, in our assumption, so we, the adversary prepares the environment first, so uh, he injects the force at the very first round, mm -hmm. and then he informs the the victim to start. So that's the reason why the fault, the fault can cross the 10 rounds. But um, we cannot say um, it can be injected any round, in the, in the middle round, um, not this one. Okay. And, and what kind of bit flips did you get in when you did the row hammer on T-tables, like 0 to 1, 1 to 0, or both? So we, I think uh, we explored, uh, it says 0 to 1. So the first element is, uh, uh, zero, uh, 63, and uh, we try to make it uh, as a 61. So it's a one to zero bit flips. Yeah. Are there any questions, other questions or comments? If not, then let's thank the speaker once more.